Thanks for tuning in, listening in. This is a conversation with Mike Cagney, the co-founder and CEO of Figure, figure figure.com. Figure has raised about $440 million. Uh, They are building financial tools using blockchain technology. Uh, We talked about the overall structure to the company, which really comprises of multiple businesses within the Figure umbrella company. They have Figure Pay, which is building out a whole network to disrupt Visa, MasterCard, and Interchange. Uh, They have a secondary market for uh, startup private companies that allow people to trade shares and ownership uh, in the secondary market. They have a uh, mortgage lending business um, that we talked a a little bit about. Uh, He is, uh, Mike has a uh, background in, he has a management degree from Stanford. Uh, where he was a Sloan Fellow. He has an MS in Applied Economics and a BA in Economics from the University of Santa Cruz. Mike identifies as, as and is a economist. So I, I really enjoyed that first 20 to 25 minutes of the show where we talked about economics and economic theory. Uh, it was really, really, really interesting. And, and we also shifted gears in the second part of the conversation to talk more about figure, more about blockchain uh, distributed technologies as a way to uh, effectively disrupt many of the large institutional financial systems that exist today. Uh, I hope to have Mike back on. He was a really exciting guest and a ton of uh, useful and insightful knowledge. L- last thing I-, I forgot to mention, he's also the co-founder of SoFi and has led multi-billion dollar businesses. So um, yeah, very inf- impressive guy. And I hope you enjoy the show. Here's Mike Cagney. All right, Mike, uh, I'm excited to go live and chat with you, man. I uh, appreciate a lot of things that you built. And one of the things I was really impressed by and excited to talk to you about uh, was your background in economics and and kind of your particular focus seemingly on macroeconomics. Uh, maybe we'll just start there. Um, what, what was it that drew you into that field in particular and what sort of keeps your interest in, in the macroeconomic, particularly the macro part of the macroeconomics? Sure. So it's, uh, I'll point out that my thesis advisor, uh, when I was doing my master's degree in applied economics, is the economist for our company. Uh, so we stayed in touch since then. And I, I've told him um, since 2008 that everything they taught us about macroeconomics was wrong. And I should get some sort of a rebate for the fees I paid for that tuition. Uh, <laughs> because it, it's, you know, everything we thought would happen didn't happen. I, I mean, I, I think this is one of, the, one of the greatest macroeconomic laboratories we could ever be in in terms of, you know, coming out of 2008, a massive amount of quantitative easing that should have been inflationary and wasn't. Uh, and then, you know, some of the, the fiscal policy responses that happened during COVID that, that are proving, you know, a combination of those plus, plus some of the supply chain logistics to have created inflation um, and the huge debate now. I, I, I was infamously quoted multiple times coming out of 2008 saying the Fed wouldn't raise rates again in my lifetime. And, you know, they raised, uh, you know, in, in right around 2018, I think, and, and uh, everyone was calling me, telling me to make sure that I wasn't driving on a freeway or doing anything where I could actually lose my life. So, uh, and, you know, but it was a mistake and they had to reverse that out. And, and now they're raising, and, you know, I think they're, they're raising in lots of ways for the wrong reason, because the underlying core of inflation wasn't business cycle. It, it was, you know, a combination of, of supply chain interruption and, and you know, the government providing incentives for people to not have to work per se and be able to drop out of the labor force. And, and so we're, we're in this crazy dynamic right now where the Fed's doing the only thing it knows what to do or how to do, um, but in doing so, they're, they're probably going to extract a decent amount of pain. And that pain is you know, being, being felt in some of the early levered sectors right now, um, certainly being felt in the housing market, uh, you know, especially the mortgage market. Um, you know, in early stages, but but I think it's it, it'll be very interesting to see how this unfolds. And, and my view is they're going to have to reverse course on this at some point. And the question is, at what point that happens, and you know, what do we resume in, at that stage? It's you know, the, the the whole thesis, and what I think is most interesting is the Austrian economist view has been that that the government can't do what it did from 2008 to 2022. But I would say that the Japanese government's been doing that since the late 80s and, you know, has not created inflation and has not done all, you know, yielded all these negative things that should have happened by printing money. 
Um, and, you know, we, there, there was a trade called the Widowmaker, which was going short Japanese government bonds. And, and it's cost many a trader their, their livelihood trying to put that position on. They're now going back into it. I read an article the other day on Bloomberg that that's now the trade du jour and everyone's loading up thinking that Japan has an untenable debt burden. Um, yeah, we'll see how it plays out. My, my gut is that, that the Fed will reverse course next year um, and actually begin to reduce rates next year. Yeah, effectively, what I, what I understand from a macro perspective tends to be the most important and the most maybe I don't know if it's the the thing that is often the most debated thing, but the degree of government intervention from a macroeconomic perspective. I think of the Keynes versus Hayek like classical debates of should we print money? Should the government get involved? Try to ease the decline or or ease the inflationary growth period? Do you? Well, let me ask you this. When you say you should get your money back from school and, and you know, obviously that's said with a light heart, do you feel that it is uh, the people in power, particularly the Federal Reserve, that have made judgment calls, decisions that you couldn't have predicted? Or is it more of the outcome of those decisions that a lot of economists were incorrect on? Yeah, I, I think it's it's exogenous factors that that never made their way into the textbook. So I think Keynesian economics, you know, from a mathematical construct, makes all the sense in the world. And you know, it's it's hard to argue on a pure math basis, uh, ignoring expectations. I think what what's happened, especially over the last two decades, is we've ignored the massive deflationary aspect of technology. Um, you know, technology is hugely deflationary, both on a first order basis. Uh, in terms of, of reducing costs and, and application, but on a second order basis in terms of supporting things like, like labor mobility um, and capital fungibility. Uh, and then demographics, right? The, the, the U.S. in particular isn't growing as fast as it's been growing. Japan, obviously, this was a huge inflationary uh, uh, headwind to them and a deflationary catalyst around their demographic situation. And so we never really took those into consideration in the construct of thinking about macroeconomics. And, and the reality is they've had profound impact and, and it's allowed the government to do things that, you know, von Hayek or von Mises would say would be impossible to do, right? Which is effectively print money without creating inflation because the underlying premise is that demand for money is constant, but it's actually not constant. And in fact, what we showed coming out of 2008 is it can go to near zero. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. And do you view that demand as being a function, maybe a lagging function, but a function of economic output? So a as a way to track people's productivity? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of things, but, but that's certainly one, one element of it. And, and I think, you know, the, the other thing that, that's been a huge surprise, and this has been a combination of, of demographics, but also you know, government intervention, is the decline of participation in the labor force. And, and so... Uh, you know, I was reading the Atlanta Fed nowcast this morning. They're, they're forecasting a negative 1% GDP print in Q2, which would actually put us in a technical recession because we were negative in Q1. Um, so everyone's saying, well, it's not really a recession. It, there's some truth to that because Q1 was negative because of inventory, not because of the consumer. But you know, Q2 will be clearly consumer driven in terms of if it's a negative print. Um, and we've never had a circumstance where we've been at full employment or even through full employment, right? We're in a three handle on unemployment, but negative growth. And, and so the only thing you can infer off of that is the only way we will grow is through technology enhancement and productivity gains, uh, because it's not going to be through labor force participation because you're not taking lots of unemployed people and reemploying them. Pretty much everyone who wants a job right now is employed. And, mm -hmm. and so, you could migrate people who have dropped out of the labor force back into the labor force. That, that's hard and that structurally you know, takes time to do. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a crazy situation no one's ever fathomed. 3.6% unemployment rate and a recession. Like, you know, and, and so what do you do in that construct if you're the Fed? And, and that's what I think the, the dilemma is that they face. And, and, you know, the fact that they've been moderately or, if, or maybe even significantly politicized um, adds, some, adds to some difficulty there. And the other factors that would play into that, you have unemployment, you have the amount of money printed recently in quantitative easing, and you have maybe money in circulation, you have rough numbers on GDP growth, consumer spending. What are the other like macro factors that would play into the, the algorithm, so to speak? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it, it really is productivity, and mm-hmm. and that's you know again because growth is going to happen through productivity because it can't happen through labor force participation because it's fully participating, and mm-hmm. and the government isn't going to be able you know if you think of Keynesian C I G and X, you know G is spent out and and actually has to go the other direction right they've, they've spent everything they can and they now need to retract. Um, you know, I, some people would say that's a function of savings. There's obviously plenty of capital in the system, whether it gets deployed into capital goods or not, you know, we'll see. Um, X, the strong dollar, uh, introduces some, some, uh, challenges around net exports. So, you know, as the dollar appreciates, which it has massively against the euro, the yen, and almost every other currency, um, that's going to be a headwind to us. And so, you know, really where you can grow is out of consumption uh, and, you know, in terms of, of driving up net aggregate demand when labor force participation is, is where it is and where the unemployment rate where it is, the only thing that's going to happen or the only way we can do that is through significant productivity gains. And I, I don't know where those gains manifest from. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think the, the challenge the Fed has, again, is you know, raising rates to fight inflation into a recession is a very difficult thing to do, both uh, both uh, politically, obviously, but also just, you know, in terms of the harm that introduces into the populace. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how they're going to navigate this. I, I think the, the numbers this morning that came out were encouraging. The second order derivatives on inflation um, are, are going negative. So it's turning the right direction and coming back down. It's still very elevated. Um, but, you know, should that continue, I think that could give the Fed some reason to pause and let this play out, especially given how tight financial conditions have gotten, you know, outside of the hikes that they've done. The, the, you know, the, if you look at the asset back market, for example, one that we're very active in, um, unsecured consumer lending asset back market is basically shut down and frozen at this point. Um, you know, the non-agency mortgage market is, is very, very difficult at this point. So you've got significant capital market tightening that, that I think is, is providing a headwind to growth that, you know, the Fed could be prudent to let that play out a little bit before they aggressively continue to push short rates higher. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I've heard some smart people say that it, it, it's a, it's a, it's impossible to make a investment decision or, uh, seriously predict the, the the macro economy, and people who are macro economists um, w- would push back on that for sure. But even hearing you say, you know, just about every macro economist was wrong from 2018 to 2020. Do, do you feel that there is a an organization to the human species so so much so that you can understand it and make make profitable bets on it, for lack of a better word? I think, I think what's made it easier, especially from a macro trading standpoint over the last 15 years is it's been predominantly driven by central bank activity, not by market forces. Mm. Because market forces, you know, Adam Smith talked about the animal spirits. They're, they're very difficult to understand or predict. And, you know, I, 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 I like to think of myself as a reasonably competent economist and I'm not a good you know, timer in terms of market tops and bottoms. So I think about, you know, fundamentals and, if I look forward 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, do I think I would have made money doing that investment or not? As opposed to, is this the absolute bottom or is this the absolute top to go long or short? Um, and, and so you know, I, I think that that we're in a situation that's, that's somewhat uncharted, but you know, the benefit over the last 15 years is, is you didn't really have to worry about much other than the central banks because they were such predominant influencers on the market you know, the Fed was the largest consumer of treasuries, then it became the largest consumer of mortgage-backed securities. In Japan, it's the largest consumer of equity ETFs, right? You know, when you have those dynamics and when the central bank very clearly indicates its direction in terms of what it's going to do and how long it's going to do it for, that provides some air cover to have some conviction around how you allocate capital. And, And so I think it's in lots of ways been easier over the last 15 to 20 years But it's been challenging from an orthodox economic standpoint because the things they've been doing haven't resulted in what we were taught they would do. Um, And and so once you embrace that and said, all right, this is actually yielding to different kinds of outcomes, then I I think it's actually been an easier market to navigate. Um, But, you know, I've I've never known anyone who is extremely competent at at, at picking tops and bottoms. But, you know, there are plenty of people that are very good at getting the systematic or systemic uh, uh, directional trades on correctly. 
Have, have you followed uh, Ray Dalio's recent uh, either YouTube or his book on the changing empires, the, the world yeah. changing corner, I think it's called. I find it yeah. interesting because it, it, it wraps in, it takes a macroeconomic view, but it also wraps in like collective social psychology on this seemingly this effect of, okay, we're going to, we're, we're in a desperate situation as a group of people. We're going to work really hard. The immigrant story, we're going to make it, we're going to be extremely productive. The economy is going to grow and then we're going to be in a better position. We're going to be benefiting from the fruits of our labor. Other people come in because they want to also live in that environment. And then people relax. They bet they, they get the, the benefits of their hard work uh, and they don't work as hard. And that cycle is effectively the underlying psych um, psychological cycle of, of empires, the Dutch, the, uh, the British, the American, I think even he references the Roman empire. And now the, the Chinese is kind of in the stage of working super hard. And, and I look at, and, and I look at it from my own anecdotal perspective and I, I, I tend to think he's right. Like we, we had a generations or a couple of generations, maybe between 1920 to 1970, 80, that was in, in a time of high productivity. Uh, maybe there was a vast majority percentage wise, higher immigrants that were coming to America for the opportunity. And I view the opportunity largely as kind of a, a free market opportunity. There wasn't a lot of restrictions on what you could create. There was a lot of problems to solve. And it's like a cycle uh, is what, how he paints it. And I had never seen that before. I kind of had a intuition that this was, that this was the case, but he so I interestingly and articulately highlighted this. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought it was fascinating reading. I, I don't necessarily agree with, with some of the underlying points. I, I think one of the things that's often misunderstood is, is the standard of living we have today is significantly higher than the standard of living we have across almost any metric that you measure it by than we had you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And you know, the idea that a lot of people talk, and this is a lot of a political rhetoric about, oh, you know, you're worse off than your, than your parents were. You're absolutely not, right? You know, penny... Obviously, there's certain ways you can measure it where you could say, yes, you are. But in general, you are in much better shape than your parents were. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that directionally is still continuing. And I also think that people often underestimate the intrinsic entrepreneurial spirit in humans. And, and you know, people are entrepreneurial and they want to build things and they want to disrupt things and they want to make things better. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely of the more of the libertarian bent. And so, you know, I, I view free markets and, and lack of intervention as great things. But the reality is, even with the press markets, even with massively high tax rates, you know, people say, oh, well, you wouldn't be an entrepreneur because the government's going to take all your money. That really wasn't the motivation as why you were an entrepreneur to begin with, right? You're still going to want to do things and invent things and disrupt things and create things. Um, and I think that that intrinsic nature, that entrepreneurial nature, um, is often discounted. And I, I don't think that's gone away. I think the entrepreneurial spirit is very, very strong in the U.S. You know, I look at the number of people that are trying to do startups right now, and, you know, in particular, whether they're, they're coming directly out of school into startups or they're leaving established industries or established positions and moving in there. There's a huge amount of entrepreneurial talent out there that wants to disrupt. And there's a lot to disrupt, right? If we think about financial services, you know, one of the largest uh, industries in, in, in all of economies, yeah, there's there's plenty that's broken that needs disruption. It's it's you know predicated entirely on intermediated marketplaces. This is why crypto has such a phenomenal application, mm. done in the right way, right? Done in a true decentralized bilateral transaction framework, not in a you know inflationary minting coin way. And and you know I'll, I'll piss a bunch of people off for saying that, but that that's kind of my my fundamental view. And so I, I I'm not one to to say oh we're on the declining side of 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 civilization or the declining side of the American civilization, I, I think America is still one of uh, you know the best place in the world to come and build a business. And people want to come here, they want to build things and they want to disrupt things. And and you know, and I'm a huge proponent of that. And and like there's there's a lot of discussion around taxation and, and so forth. And you know, should an entrepreneur be able to, to build a business and, and you know create a billion dollars of wealth? I, I don't know, but but whether they can or not, I don't think that's going to be the predicate of whether they're going to lean into do it. What's the argument? I mean, how could you say that someone shouldn't be able to? It's just that that there should be 
like taking a steel man argument on that. No, no, I, I, I wouldn't. Um, and, you know, I, again, because I, I definitely bent towards a libertarian uh, view on mm-hmm. this. And, and, you know, I think that if you do something, if you invest the time and effort and resources and take the risk, you, you get the upside and you should get the upside. All I'm saying is that even if you didn't get as much upside as, as you might have, you know, a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago, I think you're still going to do it, right? Because the motivation wasn't, I want to be a billionaire. I mean, no one wakes up and says, I want to be an entrepreneur because I want to be a billionaire. <laughs> they wake up and say, I want to be an entrepreneur because I want to build stuff that's really cool and that people can use and that can make things better for everyone. Yeah. 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 What, what do you feel like your primary motivation was? Uh, I imagine it was somewhat related and thematic through SoFi and figure, but was it just feeling yeah. like the, the life path is in economics or how do you well, articulate it? it? it, it it's kind of, it's kind of funny because, you, you know, before we be off on the call, you were talking about some of the people that you've interviewed and, and yeah, I think you, you, you didn't mention them by name, but you mentioned Chris Larson and CEO at Ripple and uh, at the time. And, and, you know, I was, I was working at, the, at Wells Fargo in the late nineties and I was looking at financial services and I was just thinking how broken so much of it was and, you know, and the, the role of the bank. And, and I'm not, I'm not a, 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 of the view that, that banks shouldn't exist and that DeFi will replace banks. In fact, I think banks play a critical role in, in the decentralized blockchain universe. And, you know, I think, I think we're seeing why they play a critical role, you know, over the last six to 12 months in terms of how things have unfolded and how they will unfold. Um, but yeah, to me, there was always something wrong. And I, I left it in 2000. I did my first startup with wealth management technology. And while I was doing that, um, Chris started a company called Prosper. And Prosper was a peer to peer lending marketplace, uh, you know, the first of its kind that, that connected sources and uses of capital outside of the bank. And it, it basically took the crowdsource idea of people will figure out what rate to charge you and, and how to secure capital for it and so forth. And, I, I just thought it was a brilliant idea and, and it really enamored me. And, and so, you know, I left my first startup, I started my hedge fund, uh, and it, you know, in 2011, I was thinking a lot about what I could do in terms of building something innovative and disruptive. And, and I was looking at the student loan marketplace and, and I was saying, you know, I don't understand why this is one size fits all because it's clear, you know, if you study degree A, you have a significantly higher chance of being employed and, and being able to service your debt than if you study degree B. And, and so why don't you tier pricing that way? And, and everyone always talks about refining their mortgage and what rate they got. Why don't they talk about refining the student loan? What, what, what rate they got? And I remember I, I called Chris up. Um, you know, because I got to know him a little bit. And I said, hey, Chris, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this, this idea of student loans. It's going to be kind of like Prosper, but for student loans. And he's, he's like, wait, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> student loans are a horrible asset. Class. This, this is never going to go anywhere. And I said, all right, but I, I think I'm going to do it anyway. And, and it, it, it kind of goes back to one of my core ethos around being an entrepreneur, which is like an entrepreneur, you need to be obtuse enough not to listen to everyone tell you you can't do something. But you also have to have some pragmatism and, and grounding that you're not trying to do the impossible, right? And it, it's sort of threading the needle in that context. And you know, so we started that up, and, and it obviously ended up being being uh, extremely successful and branching out of student loan refinancing and lots of other things around digital financial services. Um, and when I left in 2018 uh, or, or 2017, I started thinking a lot about blockchain, and I hadn't thought about blockchain before. I'd given it lip service because. You know, we always talk about uh, you know, Bitcoin and, and oh, it's important. And if you're in fintech, you have to like acknowledge Bitcoin. And I didn't really understand what it was. And I didn't understand what the value of blockchain was. And, and one day I, I was spending time looking at it and I just realized, wow, if you can displace trust with truth and you can transact bilaterally without counterparty risk, you can basically create marketplaces where you're agnostic to who's on the other side. And, and if you think about all of financial services, it's all intermediate marketplaces because you don't have that luxury, right? Like how do we trade stocks? Well, DTCC sits in the middle. How do we make payments? Well, Visa and MasterCard sit in the middle, right? There's just all this intermediation that can go away on the back of blockchain. And I, and I was like, this is huge. Like, like I'm counting up trillions of dollars of market cap that can get disrupted by the technology. And so, you know, Chris had, had, uh, had been in Ripple, um, was still at Ripple, and I called him up. And I'm like, Chris, it was, it was a phenomenal idea. I want to come talk to you about it. And I, I went up to see him at his house and, and you know, started explaining what I was doing. And he's like, Mike, it's a horrible idea. <laughs> I don't know, I want to use so blockchain for this. Like, I this got is ridiculous. 
why, 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 but why was his, I'm curious both, why was his pushback on uh, Providence and uh, student loans and here? Like what, was it a sophisticated pushback or was it just kind of? Yeah, I mean, he, he was actually, so, so when he pushed back on student loans, it, it did, that didn't help me that much. And, and, you know, I just kind of ignored it, pushed forward and, and you know, and it was a hard slog, right? No one had opened up student loans in the capital markets. We were the first to do a securitization of student loan refi debt. Um, and we opened the door to lots of other people to come in behind us, but it was some pretty heavy lifting. In, in the in the figure case with Provenance, um, you know, he he actually helped me out a lot because he's like, I don't understand why you need a blockchain for what you're describing. And and I said, What do you mean? And he's like, Well, why why can't you do this on a database? And you know, and I, I started doing the normal blockchain arguments. I'm like, Well, immutability. He's like, Well, you can make an immutable database. Right. I'm like, well, decentralization is like, well, why do you need the decentralization? And, and isn't it actually better to have intermediation in, in some of these markets? And it really forced me to think hard about why was why were we doing blockchain? What was the real value prop? And, and, and kind of, you know, and it led me to the idea that that where the biggest opportunities are in financial services for blockchain today are finding marketplaces that have huge amounts of friction where you can go in and, and release some of that friction through bilateral transactions, right? This is why you, you can't go out to the NASDAQ on day one because there's not a lot of friction in that marketplace. It functions pretty well. Like you can mm -hmm. you can absolutely drive marginal improvement in there, but you're not gonna disrupt how we trade stocks. Whereas private company stock, for example, you know, horrible friction, closed end funds, horrible friction. Like you can bring blockchain into those marketplaces with native digital assets, loans and whole loans, right? Huge mm -hmm. opportunity. And, and so, it actually helped me a lot because it got me focused on where is the real where is the real value that we can deliver with the technology and what, what should we focus on. So rather than approaching it in a panacea, well, I'm going to disrupt the Nasdaq. It's I think we are going to disrupt the Nasdaq at some point, but we're starting with private company stock because that marketplace is horribly broken, right? And and if you just suck less, you've done a much better job than the people that are there already, right? So it's a low bar to deliver improvement into that. Yeah. Do you think of that? If you think of this, if we go a little deeper on this topic of identifying the attributes of what would make a uh, almost like a, like what are the, what are the the spectrum of attributes that make a blockchain? We'll call it like a blockchain company successful. It's um, there's certainly a lot of friction. There's a big market. There's probably an existing market. So it wouldn't be something like uh, you're not going into a space of uh, I was talking to a, a friend about recruiting and you have th there's not really a centralized place where people go to trade or hire people it's it's kind of a fr super fragmented market do you think the do you think it's important to have a an established way of doing business or like taking the the Uber route where you know Uber kind of went in and said not to say Uber is related to blockchain but it went in and kind of created a whole new marketplace in and of itself. Uh, yeah, so, I, I, so, so I'll give you a, a good example, but I'll start, and I'm, I'm gonna contradict myself as I go through this. I, I, in general, I think the underlying starting position you have to have is the ability to represent the asset native digitally on chain. Yeah. And and so what I, what I constantly shake my head at is people like, you know, the old idea of I'm gonna put a Picasso on the blockchain well, that doesn't make any sense to me, right? Because I don't know that the Picasso exists. I don't know that you haven't put it on seven blockchains. Like, you know, how do I know it is what it's supposed to be? And, and you know, it goes back to that whole concept of trust versus truth. Um, you know, you want truth over trust and bilateral transactions. So I can transact bilaterally with that construct, but, but you don't know that what I have is actually true. Mm -hmm. And this extends out, you know, people have been trying to do the commercial real estate plays on blockchain. Like, oh, we can buy fractional interest in an office building. Well, the title's not on chain. So, like, what do you know that you actually own in that construct? And, and by the way, there's infinitely better ways to run marketplaces for LLC interest than, than you know, the overhead of a blockchain. And so, you know, in general, I, I think it's predicated on having a native digital asset where I've got the provenance, the composition, the ownership on chain. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that for true as opposed to for, for trust. The one exception to that, and, and where I think there's going to be some interesting opportunity to really catalyze a marketplace that hasn't had a, you know, has a lot of attention, but not a lot of substance is around uh, carbon trading. 
And, you know, you can get a trusted oracle who can say, yes, you've planted these forests, you've generated these carbon credits, or yes, you, you know, whatever the activity you've done in analog world, we trusted oracle will validate that that exists here on chain and these carbon credits are true. And then the ability to trade those carbon credits on a public decentralized chain and retire them in a public forum, to me, is super powerful. Right, because then I don't have to trust that United Airlines really buy, you know, 10 million metric tons of carbon. I can see that they bought it and I can see they retired the credit. Hmm. And so you can take things from project life cycle. So you set up an SPV on the chain in digital asset form and it invests in a particular carbon uh, carbon offsetting event. All the owners of that, uh, of that SPV get their allocation of those carbon credits. They can go into a marketplace and begin to trade those. Um, and, and I think you're going to get a very efficient construct from project origination all the way down to carbon consumption or credit consumption uh, that'll happen on chain. And, and I think there's a, there's obviously a ton of different applications on there. I think private company stocks going to going to be massively overhauled. You know what we're doing today is we run secondaries of private company equity um, where we run 24 hour a day, seven day a week marketplaces, and it trades you know just like the Nasdaq or the NYSE, but it settles instantly. Um, and, and that blur between public and private is going to become close, you know, it'll get closer and closer as the companies are larger, they run more frequent secondaries. And at some point, the, they'll, you'll start having public securities trade on that marketplace. And, and that's, you know, that's sort of the ultimate disruption of, of how that happens. And, you know, I, I, we have a general view at, at Figure called R10, which is real time everything marketplace, which is our view that, Anything that can be digital should be native digital on chain and traded bilaterally on a decentralized exchange. Yeah. Uh, so when you think about the rollout on private markets, do you feel like the catalyst here, I guess, first off, is the uh, SEC change on the regulation allowing for retail investors to invest in private markets where this wouldn't have been possible prior to that? I think it was the Reg CF or something, something else. Yeah, and, there, and, and there's and there's a bunch of stuff the SEC's done. Um, you know, they, they have limited purpose offerings like mm-hmm. regular offerings now that that retail investors can come into, um, and then they have you know 506C, which allows you to do general solicitation as long as you do proactive accreditation. Um, but those accreditation rules have been expanded out as well in terms of who is accredited uh, to be able to participate. I think as you get to a situation where you introduce more liquidity and more pricing transparency. The, the burden or the hurdle for having retail investors to participate will drop and you'll level the playing field. And, and you know, that, that I think is huge. And, you know, I remember, I, I, this is a great lesson to me. I was so excited. I went to my venture uh, investors and I said, this is great because you can put your funds on the blockchain and then they can own a bunch of securities that are trading real time on the blockchain and you can get a real time nav. And, and they were like, that's the worst idea ever. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I don't understand why. Why, why is it real time? Why, why? They're like, no, we like, to, we like to control the nav. You know? I was like, well, that's wrong. Like, it should be transparent and everyone should know what it is. So, Wait, so it, it, what do you mean by that? What, what's the nav? I'm not familiar. The, the net asset value of the fund. So, okay. so basically, if, if I'm a fund and I hold three companies, those, those three companies are all trading on, on a, a decentralized market on blockchain. I, I know exactly what the value of the fund is. Mm. But the investor, the venture firms like to control how often they mark and at what level they mark. Yeah, uh, yeah. So they don't like that real time pricing transparency. Yeah, yeah. Ironically, it seems like the crypto market has effectively opened up the extreme opposite end of the spectrum, where oh, yeah. you know it's like there was a there's a reason why. I, I, although I do disagree with it in principle, we had the accredited investor laws, where only like what five percent of people in in the, the society can invest in in uh, in private companies, so you're you're limiting someone's ability to invest in like an Airbnb or or an Uber when they're private. But then you could go into the crypto market and spend all your savings and buy some token that has no basis for existing in the first place. Uh, do you feel like it's? it's I, I'm interested in the trends, especially on the regulation side, because it's to, for me the only way to understand what potentially could be coming down the pipeline. Uh, in this black box of the SEC and, and other governmental bodies, it seems like the SEC is moving towards more open, uh, lo- less regulation. They're, they're kind of clawing back some of the rules they had in place, at least with the few that we just highlighted. Uh, crypto, I think they just have to and are, are going to introduce 
laws in the first place. There really was nothing there to start with. Do, do you yeah. do you understand or have a perspective on the general like pendulum swings of of how the important bodies so, might be looking at things? Yeah, I, I, I do, and I, I work extremely closely with the regulators, uh, both the, the security regulators and the banking regulators around different things that we do as it relates to the blockchain. We have a broker dealer and we have an alternative trading system exemption mm. and our ATS alternative trading system uh, is very unique in that it allows us to support marketplaces for native blockchain securities. And I think it's the only ATS that, that allows that provision. And what's unique about it is those securities self clear. So the broker dealer doesn't take any intermediate role in transactions or bilateral transactions. And I remember you know, going to the FINRA office and sitting down with them and explaining this. And they said, well, what do you do if a trade breaks? And, you know, and I was, I was dumb about it. I, you know, in classic being flippant and naive, I was like, well, a trade can't break because you encumber both sides. So, you know, they buy a lot of the transactions and settle. And the guy put his coffee down and he looked at me and he, he said, listen, idiot, I've been doing this for 30 years and trades break. And I want to know what's going to happen when the trade breaks. And, and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. So I said, well, well you call the administrator. And, and so we, we made an administrator that I don't really know what they could have done, but they administrated stuff. No one ever called the administrator for two years. Then they let me get rid of the administrator, right? <laughs> but, but it's just, you know, it's, it's this dynamic that there's a huge amount of education that needs to happen in terms of, well, you know, what, what is a decentralized chain? And, and you know, I'm, I'm dealing with this right now on the banking side with, with USDF, which is the bank stablecoin that, that we help facilitate. And the regulators are asking good questions, right? It's a public chain. And they say, well, what is, and it's a, it's a uh, proof of stake, uh, decentralized proof of stake chain. So they say, well, what if a validator's on an OFAC list? And a mm -hmm. bank goes on to transact, they pay a gas fee, and it goes to an OFAC listed validator that just broke the law. And, and that's a really interesting question. And you've got to figure out, okay, well, how am I going to solve that problem? And how am I going to ensure the validators are on an OFAC list, or at least the ones that are, I can designate. And you can decide not to send transactions to them. Um, you know, why, what about the bank being a validator? Well, conversely, what if the bank validates a bad actor transaction? And, you know, what, what happens then? And, and, you know, it's a misnomer in the idea of validation because you're not endorsing anything. You're simply just writing the transaction to the chain. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to navigate through. And, and what I thought was fascinating, uh, you know, and, and I hadn't realized this. So, so as we were having this conversation, I was talking to the regulators, I said, well, look, what do all the other banks do? How do they deal with this? How's JP Morgan deal with this? And they say, well, JP Morgan doesn't, doesn't participate on a public blockchain. And I said, that's impossible. I go and I look it up and everything that they've done has been on private ports of Ethereum or Quorum or, you know, things that are private networks or private chains. And I went through and I, I realized I couldn't find any bank that has participated on a public chain other than Provenance. And, and Provenance, there's, you know, about 50 banks that have done transactions on there from very small ones to, you know, the biggest in the, in the country. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I think the reason we've been able to get there is because of how proactive we've had to be with the regulators and trying to deal with these thorny issues and solving these problems. Hmm. And, and there's still a lot of work to go there. You know, we, we don't have general approval of USDF as a reciprocal stablecoin between banks, but implicitly a bank can bank someone who intermediates like a circle, for example, and then provide that service outside. And it's, you're, the service is still being done. There's, there's, you know, 140 billion stable coin out there. And, and isn't it better to have the bank face off to that than not, than, than simply be the repository for the cash. And that's, you know, that, that argument is logical, but you know, it doesn't necessarily take immediate hold. And so, you know, I, I think the big changes from a regulatory standpoint, obviously the SEC case against Ripple is, is significant because that, you know, potentially has ramifications of classification of, of, of security versus utility and, and, you know, would throw a lot of Howie tests into, into limbo in terms of what these things are. Um, and so we're all watching that very, very closely. Um, I think in general, blockchain does a lot of things the SEC wants, public blockchain, which is better transparency, uh, better price discovery, um, you know, I think these are things that would lower the bar for retail participation into broader networks. And, and you know, what traditionally has been private securities where you can level the playing field and, and allow access to that. I think on the banking side, you know, the, we're not there yet, particularly with the OCC. 
Um, you know, I think the Fed is thinking progressively about it. I think the FDIC is a little bit, a little bit stuck right now. Um, so I don't see an immediate revelation coming on the banking side outside of legislation that would push them to that. And I think mm. to me and others have bills out there that I think could be very helpful for the industry and define the rules and the guidelines and the rails. Um, but, you know, right now everyone's very tentative uh, and, and, you know, so that introduces some challenges. And unfortunately, the, the blowups that we've had recently aren't going to help us from a regulatory standpoint. It's no. going to provide a lot of the naysayers validation. I told you this was all crap. It's all a scam. And it would provide, you know, validation to the regulators to say it's too early for banks to lean in and participate. Mm. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. Uh, I just hope it doesn't come back with whiplash that ends up costing us decades of progress. When you talk to these folks, do you feel that there's two things I kind of want to ask you? One is uh, you alluded to the overall sophistication or at least um, <laughs> desire to have a nuanced view of these things. Do you feel there's a, do you feel that the regulators by and large are aligned with the interests of innovation and, and retail investors or in addition to that, could they are they potentially influenced by other other goals? I don't know if if it's a goal of becoming larger as a as a regulating body or influenced by lobbyists or something that's not you know introducing the concept of corruption in there. How do you feel about their performance so yeah. far? So? I I think I think that they're I, I think that they have the right intent. You know, but the but the as as the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good yeah, intentions. Yeah, so, so true. Um, so I think I think they have the right intent. I don't think they have enough education to know how to actually opine on what to do, and that's why I said it, it, you know this might need to become this might need to come out of the legislative side, which is how how the legislators set the rules and have the regulators enforce them because you know the regulators setting the rules is a dangerous dangerous and very slippery slope and. And, and so I feel for them in that. I have a lot, of, a lot of sympathy for them in that construct. You also have huge embedded interests that have no, no, no desire at all to see the manifestation of blockchain technology, especially in financial services. Right. So, right, right. you know, if, if like, and, you know, so, so for example, if I'm Visa or I'm MasterCard, of course I'm going to talk to everyone about how great blockchain is, but secretly I never want to see it come to fruition because it's, you know, bilateral money movement. And, and, you know, I'm no longer control of rail. Uh, if I'm DTCC, of course, I'm going to tell everyone I'm doing tons of interesting stuff on blockchain, but I don't actually want it to manifest because what role do I have as a registrar when it's a native blockchain security? And, and so, you know, you have these very large established interests um, that are incredibly powerful, at, you know, because of dollars of lobbying dollars. Uh, that will say all the right things publicly, but but if you really peel back the onion, don't have a huge amount of incentive to see this technology manifest. And and so those are big headwinds that you have. Yeah, I even wonder, there was a, a guy I interviewed a while back that had this story that I, I had never heard, but it sounded fascinating, which was his basic claim was that early days Visa influ um, sponsored a group. Uh, I forget the name of the group. Um, but they were early contributors to uh, Bitcoin, and the concept, the the principle that they were trying to put forth in the early development was to move it away from a concept of cash, which was in the white paper and part of the the real principle of the architecture to more of a, a store of value more akin to gold so if you can shift the concept of goal of bitcoin in people's mind to more of a long-term store of value like gold then you're less of a competitive threat to visa mastercard and i have no idea the extent to which that story is true but it seems the it seems the the architecture is there to at least make it compelling because it, Bitcoin is more analogous to gold than it is to cash today. The transaction times, the security, the protocol, everything else. Um, no, that's, that's true. Although, although it is a phenomenal cross-border remit tool right now. Yeah. And you know, the transaction costs have come down enough. And you know, as, as long as you're not stuck with it for long periods of time, which you don't need to be. Um, you know, it, it, it's actually, you know, when you go to the, the Coinstar kiosks and, you know, we always think about Coinstars where we take all our nickels and dimes and quarters and get a gift card out of it. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of those kiosks now do Bitcoin transactions and, you know, a predominant driver for those transactions is cross-border remit. Mm. So people go there, drop in some cash, move Bitcoin to, you know, their, their relative's wallet, wherever they might be. 
Um, you know, and, and transaction time and, and cost on the Bitcoin network isn't excessive right now. I mean, it's, it's infinitely cheaper and faster than Ethereum today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I imagine the interchange rate just has to be under a ton of pressure to uh, you know, be compressed down. I mean, Visa MasterCard seem like their business model is so deeply embedded in, into that rate. Well, and, and what's interesting about it is, and, and I always, I always call it a tax. I call it a transaction yeah. tax, and, and they, they get really mad when I call it that. Um, <laughs> it is, but but, but, I, but I, I, I'm like, look, it's a five party ecosystem. You got to feed the issuing bank, the issuing processor, Visa or Mastercard, the merchant bank, and the merchant acquirer. And the reality is, the, the bulk of the economics comes to the issuing bank, and and that's Chase. And, and so, you know, the, the crazy thing about JP Morgan doing JP coin and all this other stuff is they also are, you know, have one of the biggest uh, things to lose in terms of uh, being able to bilaterally move money. Like if they're not an issuing bank and, you know, and, and their whole thing is, well, the rewards program, well, okay, but, but the rewards program is subsidized by the people who get nothing. So you deliver solutions to them first. So I, I don't get any rewards. Fine, I can transact bilaterally. And the merchant's going to pay me because of the benefit of circumventing interchange and getting paid real time versus in three days. And once you take me out, then all of a sudden they don't have 400 basis points to pay Chase Platinum rewards. They have 300, right, or 200, whatever the number is. And you just start going at it level by level. And at some point, it'll just play us out. And, and I 100% I believe that bilateral transactions and migrating the reward incentive away from the issuing bank to the merchant where the merchant can do very rich contextual rewards at point of sale, that's a hugely disruptive idea. That if, like if I was Google, I'd be leaning on that hard right now, building that out. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I've, I've I've tried to impress that on them. They don't they don't listen to me, but they're you know because I figured out the resources to do that. But but someone is going to step in and just build a transformative you know interchange 2.0 system that you know pushes a lot of the benefit back to the merchants and then allows the merchants to drive contextual rewards to the customer in a way that they couldn't historically. Yeah, it's basically three-ish percent back to the merchants that they could pass on to the customer or embed some kind of right. loyalty program. Yeah. And not only 3%, no chargebacks because it's the same as cash and an instant settlement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the problem is people can't spend more money than they have. So what are they going to do? <laughs> Yeah, that goes back to our, our uh, opening macro discussion. But yes, yeah, 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 it absolutely does. I, I want to ask you a little bit more about um, the business with Figure. How, how do you sort of see the, uh, the 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 macro pieces of Figure? It's one of the more the business had a lot has a lot of components to it. Uh, how do you sort of see the big blocks, uh, the big uh, puzzle pieces to the company, and how they fit together in a strategic cohesive? Vision. Yeah, so there's there's basically four parts of the company. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lending business. And the lending business in itself has two parts. So you've got the the core lending. You know, most of what we do today is HELOC because of rates backing up. If rates go back down, we'll start start doing mortgages again. Um, but you know, we're we're generating digital assets on chain. So we're the first to do real consumer loans on blockchain. First to warehouse and securitize. And you know, we've done billions of dollars in transactions on provenance at this point. There's also a lending technology piece, and that's anchored by something we call DART, which stands for Digital Asset Registry Technology. And what DART does is it acts as a registrar to ensure perfection of interest on digital assets. And so we do this today for mortgages, where we have an e-note and we can perfect who the owner of the mortgage is, so we don't need MERS, which is the mortgage electronic registry service that people used to use, we can use DART. But you can use DART for anything. You can use it for NFTs. You can use it for any digital asset on, on the blockchain and, and use that as a true enforceable perfection of ownership structure or registrar. Then we've got the marketplace stuff. And that's, you know, figure out solutions. We have five, over 500 companies now that run their cap table entirely on provenance. And they, they can access primary and secondary liquidity through the marketplaces. We have figure out solutions, which is um, closed end funds, uh, TA function, universal passporting where I get one accreditation, KYC, email, and I can go to multiple investments mm -hmm. without having to reestablish myself and then secondary liquidity. Um, and that, you know, our broker dealer sits on top of that and facilitates those marketplace transactions. And, and then we have payments and, and payments is really around USDF. And the original thesis on USDF is, is we said, look, we're going to create bank mints and stable coin. We're going to have a reciprocal clearinghouse to net settle that on every day. Um, et cetera, et cetera. I think given the, the pace of how fast the regulators are moving, 
we're probably going to step in ourselves and intermediate between the bank and the market. Um, and, and we will create a stable coin backed by bank deposits uh, that you know has all the all the ability that a USDC would have in terms of wall to wall peer to peer hops, um, but it will also um, facilitate the ability for the banks to run their own peer to peer network so they can get off of Zelle. Um, it would allow the bank to become merchant acquirer so they could actually go and, and direct the merchants to transact on the stablecoin network versus on interchange. Um, so you know we we think there's there's a huge amount of disruption here, and we we wish we didn't have to do the intermediary step where we stepped in to do it. You know, we wish the banks would be able to do it directly, but, but you know, I don't think the regulators are going to get there in time and we want to get this to market now. So, you know, you'll, you'll hear this over the next couple of weeks that we're going to step in and start doing stablecoin activity on behalf of the banks. Mm. Yeah, they seem that, that last idea in particular with the USDF and stablecoin network with the banks seems like such a big idea in and of itself. I could see that being its own, I don't know if it, I don't know if it would be a company or it'd be a, be a some sort order. Of like, it, it is. It is, yeah. yeah. Is that not... I mean, what I want to ask you is like, is there a cost to growth on the other initiatives by having four of these like unique? Yeah, so, so big figures really a blockchain holding company, mm. and and you know, fortunately, our lending business is big enough and and does enough activity that it, it generates profit for the whole business, right? So it covers all the other costs that we do. Um, we generate cash right now, mm. which is a little bit of an anomaly um, in tech universities. Um, so sometimes that's in style, sometimes that's out of style. It's, it's coming back in style. Uh, and, but, but what we're going to do is we will eventually divest all these businesses out. And, you know, they'll have their own CEOs, they'll have their own cap table and their own capital. Uh, and, you know, it ties into the fourth thing that we do, which is provenance. So we, we own a large chunk of hash, which is the underlying utility token on provenance. You know, hash today on a market cap basis, it's like the 13th or 14th largest. If you count mm -hmm. the, the stable points in that, mm -hmm. um, in terms of market capitalization, it trades on OKCoin, okay but it trades on Osmosis and, and a, DLA, a text called DLA. Um, and, you know, our, our ultimate goal is we think that's where the home run is. And so we're just trying to drive as much adoption on the chain, as much, as much um, you know, hash fees on chain as we possibly can. Uh, and yeah, you know, we see each of these businesses as really being able to you know, be first mover on blockchain and get the first order advantage of that, but also drive huge amounts of fees and crowd in a lot of competition to, to drive even more fees onto the network. Mm. And it, do you see that the big, maybe I'm, I think I'm understanding you, but the, the, the biggest idea of these would be the network of USDF to allow the banks to facilitate uh, bilateral transactions with merchants. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, that's that's enormous. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's uh, you know, and that that is that is your interchange killer. That's that and, that's the size of all the. I mean, that add up the revenue from the five you know merchant acquirer and Visa and the acquiring bank. Add all that together. That's the market size, right? Yeah, it's huge, and and you know you're talking about trillions of dollars of market cap, and and that you know that that's all ultimately that accrues into the value of the token. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't seem, I mean, to me, it seems like you had this lift probably in the 70s, maybe 60s, 70s, I think it was, where you had a ton of merchant acquirers, people who were starting sales organizations, basically, that would go door to door to restaurants. They would sell them the merchant terminal yeah. and say, I mean, the major motivation was, hey, if you accept a check, that check might bounce. So use a credit card. It's instantaneously approved and you're guaranteed to get paid for it. Uh, minus this thing of chargebacks, but there was a, a huge explosion of uh, these merchant sales organizations. I actually went to a, this conference like six years ago because I was I started a company that was building a point of sale system and curious about it all. And it's just mind blowing how that's what it is. So there's this like this funnel distribution of of uh, money for whoever signed up the merchant, like businesses who have been in business a long time or remember. Uh, getting door-to-door -door salesmen trying to sign them up for lower rates on merchant yeah. processors. I do you see the do you see a similar rollout? A lot of I caveat that by saying the the merchants are not they tend to react best to salespeople, and I I don't know how yeah, to change that. But so, so I think I think there's a pretty interesting and I'm give you some anecdotal evidence as well. But what when what Square did when they came out with their FOB. Hmm was they basically disrupted that hardware at point of sale, right? They're like, no, just plug this into your mobile and you'll circumvent you know, a lot of the acquisition expense related to this. 
and you know, Square became a merchant acquirer through a FOB plugin. What what we've done is we've taken that one step further and we just allow the mobile phone to generate a QR code. And you can scan that QR mm-hmm. code with a mobile device and then the money's moved instantly mm-hmm. immediately. And so you're just downloading a simple application. And, and what what I'm trying to impress on the banks is I'm saying, look, go to your banking customers and be the merchant acquirer. Like tell them, I will give you technology to accept USDF as a payment. And instead of paying 300 basis points, I'll charge you 50, right? Or 75 or whatever the number is. And, and you, the bank went from making 15 to 20 basis points as merchant acquirer or, or merchant bank uh, historically to now, you know, 50 to 75 basis points as merchant acquirer. You've disintermediated Square at the point of sale acquisition, but you now also have the same high frequency data that Square Capital has to be able to lend to those merchants real time against, you know, uh, ebbs and flows and sales. And, and so you're, you're in a situation where you can actually leap forward over some of the fintechs that have disintermediated your access to that consumer, that, that customer, that, that business. Um, and, and that's what I think is, is sort of the first leg of this. The second leg of this is going to the merchant and saying, look, you know, you, you just netted out 225 basis points. Here's how to embed it in rewards programs, you know, and, and contextual rewards, geolocation, proactive, uh, you know, I always, I always do the, the example that if Starbucks was running on figure pay and one of their customers went to Pete's and bought a coffee, not only would they see that, but when that customer walked past the Starbucks store, they could push them a coupon, hey, come into Starbucks and get a free coffee because Pete sucks, right? right. And, and you know, that level of contextual <laughs> delivery. Now, that'd be kind of freaky. People might not like that, <laughs> but, uh, you know, from a privacy standpoint, but, but, but you have the ability to do it. And that's... That's where I think we can go. I, I, I think we're going to see an entirely new payments ecosystem built up around Stablecoin um, and one that's much more efficient, that's much more beneficial to the merchant, that keeps money in local communities, which is a huge thing, versus sending it out to the issuing bank. Um, but that will allow the merchant to be much more contextual around co- rewards and customer engagement. That, that, I think, is going to be a big win. Yeah, God, when, it, when you explain it in that way, I, I can't see how it goes any other way. I mean, it's good. Like you, the stable coin makes the most sense. I, I can't quite see, maybe in the evolution, but certainly not in the onset of merchants accepting all different types of, of cryptocurrencies. They're, they're probably going to want something very simple. Tied to the U.S. dollar is very simple. Um, w- remind me, what? What? How does the figure revenue model work in this? Or what would be? Yeah, so so we don't we don't own the USDF consortium. It's a yeah. it's a it's a bank owned network, right. and it's the bank minted stablecoin. So we we provide the technology to both allow the banks to access the network to mint and burn coin. Okay, and we also provide the technology to allow the merchants to generate QR code at point of sale. Mm-hmm. So we're we're basically just the on off ramps. So do you see it as like a subscription fee, like a monthly SaaS play to merchants and some? It, it, it could be. It could be a per transaction fee. I mean, the, the, here's the other thing that's interesting about it from our perspective. Remember that that that's the first order around figure the operating business. The more relevant thing for us is the second order around the hash fees it generates mm. to move that money on blockchain, mm. right? And that's that's ultimately we we will earn more off of that than we will off of the operating. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like what Square got right was they, they gave it away. They said, let's just, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and if you look at what they do with Square Cash, right? I mean, they, I, I thought Square Cash was brilliant because they, they, they basically subsidized a banking application. They lost a lot of, you know, initially a lot of money on it, but they had a, they created a critical mass of consumers and now they have a closed loop payment network mm-hmm. with all their, all their Square merchants. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so, that to me was was and and they had the capital to, to withstand the beginning efforts of that to get to the end game. The end game is yeah they've got a closed loop network with I think thirty five million customers on it. That's a big deal. Yeah, and that, probably the economics they're thinking about in that scenario is a per cost per user acquisition or a, a acquisition cost per well, user. I, I, I think they're thinking about displacing the issuing bank and taking that economic back, right? So they're, they're saying, look, 300 basis point, now it's 200, 225 or whatever. And instead of paying Chase 200, we square take 125, 150. Mm-hmm. And you use that to subsidize. You, you, you make the model with that as the revenue to subsidize the acquisition costs. So you can lose money up front. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's right. And, and, and it's, and that's, that is incredibly valuable revenue, you know, way more than earning, you know, the debit interchange credit on your consumers on the mobile banking app, mm -hmm. right? The, the transactional revenue is, is infinitely more valuable to you. And so here, if someone goes into a Starbucks to buy a coffee, they're paying like $1 and one cent or 50 basis points for uh, on top of the, well, or the, or the, mer the merchants paying the back end. Uh, okay. right? so yeah, yeah. Paying yeah, yeah. And, and the merchants even the back end. And then, and then the benefit is, is the merchants on that closed loop network, then not only is it cheaper, but they get paid real time. So the money is there as soon as the consumer swipes. They're not waiting three days for ACH to settle a data transaction. Yeah. What do you think about going bottom up versus top down on merchant merchant sizes? So Square going bottom up, they went to like the farmers markets because everyone had a phone, and then they kind of clawed their way up. I'm seeing if you can if the core value prop is uh, decrease uh, interchange, then there's such a huge incentive to go top down. So who's selling? like yeah. large ticket items right. so who's going to amazon and walmart and yeah, like that's exactly where to go yeah yeah right and, and walmart in particular is super interesting because they already enable qr checkout mm. and and so they have the infrastructure there you know i think they they, they obviously have their own fintech wing uh that they did in conjunction with rivet I'm, I'm sure they're thinking a lot about this um and you know i know that interchange is their number one focus but yeah i, I think the number was in 2019 uh, Walmart paid something like $2 billion in interchange expense. Uh, Billion. That's significant. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, look, if, if, you're, if you're a retail merchant, you've got a 10% profit margin, two points is a big deal. Three points is a huge Huge, deal, yeah. Right? Um, and so that, that can make or break your business. So, and, and, you know, going back to this, we've gone to a bunch of small merchants with, with figure pay to get them on and do QR and, and like the level of hate the merchants have on interchange is just unfathomable. Mm. You know, they, they are desperate for a better solution. It's just, you know, it's got integrated with their, their back office or QuickBooks or whatever it is in terms of booking records. And it's gotta be easy for them to use and they need control over it. But you know, you, you can solve all those things. And, and again, Square solved that with the, the dongle first and, so it's really you know, not a huge leap to do that on a native mobile device. Yeah. I was talking to a guy who built out a, he's building like a payment um, system for specifically now for El Salvador because they legalize Bitcoin as, as uh, legal tender. Yeah. And he's telling me that he was down there, his team is down there and they're just, people aren't using it and they're not using it because of the volatility in the currency, not because of the, the premise of the technology. So I think to your point, the, uh, it, you know, the having the network based in the USD just makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, and we flew through an hour. Anything you wanted to add about uh, you personally, the market conditions, anything else that's just been on your mind? Uh, as, as the Chinese curse goes, we live in interesting times. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you have any particular view on like, um, I, I know we're technically in a recession, but do, do you look around the world and see a, a ton of productivity and feel like it's a bump in the road or feel like it's a long slog? No, I, I, I think I think we're going to resume back onto a long-term deflationary course, mm. and and you know I don't know what it is that's going to disrupt that. I think you know obviously we got some idiosyncratic events between COVID and and, and the Ukraine war uh, with Russia that that uh, you know certainly have impacted both energy markets and supply chains. Mm. Uh, but I think I think as that gets worked through, and as the government stimulus wears off, that was there to offset the COVID impact. Uh, we're going to resume back onto a long-term deflationary trend, mm. and, it, you know, and and that's that's not necessarily good or bad. It just it, it means that a lot of the tenets that we held true in macroeconomics, you know, per the, the way we started the discussion, aren't going to hold true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, any particular people or or books that have been inspiring to you, or or things that you, people that you track? Yeah, you know, the, the, the one person that I think had the biggest impact on me as an entrepreneur uh, was, was Yuri Milner, the founder of DST. And, and it was really around, he, he was an extremely entrepreneurial friendly investor. Mm. And, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of your venture investors aren't, right? And, and there, there used to be this old dogma in the valley that you do secondaries and your venture investors will say, well, you absolutely cannot sell stock in your secondary because you need to be all you know, 100% in, all in on this. Like this needs to be your thing. And, and he said, well, do you ever ask him if they're your only venture investment? <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm like, well, you know, because of course they'd say no. He's like, well, why do they get to diversify and you don't? 
And, and I said, that's an excellent point. And, and then he went on to say, look, you want to give your, you want to give your employees liquidity because what you want them to do is constantly be trying to create value, not steward a value to, to fruition. And, you know, you get a company and you're successful and you're worth 500 million or, or maybe even a billion or whatever the number might be. And people look at what they're worth and they say, I really want to hold this. Right. And, and so I don't want to do things that swing for the fence that could cause massive swing in the value of the business. That changes if you let them take some cash out, right? Because then they have, you know, enough there that they're willing to continue, you know, continue to take risk and lean in. And, and that that was extremely helpful for me in terms of of you know both how how we dealt with uh, compensation and, and liquidity for folks at SoFi, and certainly how we've done it at Figure. Uh, and yes, you know, I just think he's he's a rarity in that you know he's an entrepreneur and he is very entrepreneurial friendly in, in how he thinks about investing and allocating. He's not as active as he was. Um, you know, there's a lot of other people now at DST that are they're doing most of the investing over there. But his his conversations with me early on were extremely uh, impactful. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that point too. I think it's better for investors to have founders take out secondary because then they can buy the buy the condo, do whatever they need to do to feel personally yeah. secure, and then swing for the fences. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Cool, man. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed your perspective. I, I love talking to people that are uh, interested in and educated in, in the macroeconomic piece and obviously super exciting business. So hope you guys continue to crush it and uh, make this a reality for the merchants, which would be fucking right. awesome. Well, I, I very much appreciate you having me and, and thanks for tolerating my macro. <laughs> I, 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 I don't hold that they're right or wrong. They're just my views. I love it. All right. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thank you.